So here we go. Today, we're going to talk about carnivore diet. Have you ever heard that saturated fats cause heart attacks? And by therefore, a meat-based diet like carnivore diet must cause heart attacks. Well, today we're going to be reviewing the real evidence behind that claim. In recent years, there's been a growing trend towards the carnivore diet, where people eat only animal products and decrease or even exclude all plant-based foods from their meals. Well, at least that's the way it seems and it sounds, but just like everything else, when you dig deeper, it gets more complicated, far more complicated. The definition of carnivore diet, uh, next time somebody tells you they're carnivore, dig a little bit deeper. So for, for example, one carnivore content creator we recently had on board on the show, Ken Berry, routinely talks about meat and veg. Paul Saladino, another carnivore content creator, includes fruits. Some carnivores even routinely include honey. Now, if you, including honey, and you say animal products, I would have said that's an insect product. Anyway, let's go on. Thomas DeLauer, he likes to do the following types of video titles, like why carnivores stopped carnivores, or why a fasting guru stopped fasting. Now, if you actually listen to DeLauer's videos and watch those gurus like Rhonda Patrick, Paul uh, Saladino, and others, you see the theme, a recurring theme, moderation. As Thomas DeLauer himself says, and many others have said, this is a well-known quote, moderation in everything, even in this rule. Now, carnivore is a way for many people to very simply achieve moderation in carbs. You see, our current culture is just sick. Up to 80% of us, of adults, are awash in too much insulin coming from too many processed carbs. So while it might seem surprising or even extreme, there are several reasons why some individuals choose to adopt this dietary approach. For example, those who do a carnivore diet often cite its potential health benefits as a primary reason for their choice. They argue that consuming only animal products can eliminate potential allergens and irritants found in plant foods, which they believe can contribute to digestive issues, inflammation, and other health problem, problems. And again, yep, you just don't find lectins in meats. You find them in plants. Some people claim that following a carnivore diet has helped them alleviate symptoms of autoimmune disorders, digestive in inflammatory disease, arthritic inflammatory diseases, and for most of them, yes, losing weight. It is a very popular way to lose weight. But let's get back to the simplicity for a second. I'm an omnivore. I'm like, uh, we had uh, food guru Robert Lustig on the show uh, a couple of months ago. And I tend to agree with him. Um, but an omnivore can get caught up in food decision fatigue. Unlike other diets that involve complex meal planning, and food restrictions, the, the carnivore diet offers a very simple, clear set of guidelines. Meat, fish, eggs, dairy, and avoid everything else. That is clear and easy. So Lustig makes a good point. Back to Lustig for a second. His point is, and we agree, I agree, uh, the major focus is insulin stimulation. Like we said, we're awash in a sea of insulin, and that's what's killing us. He believes that you can get away from that insulin sea, get moderation on insulin through multiple diets. In fact, most diets, keto, paleo, carnivore, vegetarian, vegan, all the diets, maybe, except clearly one, the sad diet the standard American diet. You cannot combine tons of processed carbs with anything and end up with a good outcome. So 
back to the carnivores by focusing on nutrient dense foods, these individuals on the carnivore diet believe they can easily using that easy button, optimize their nutritional intake and support overall health and well-being. So for that reason, some individuals are drawn to the carnivore diet and for again, weight loss. Eliminating carbs forces the body to burn fat for fuel, leading to significant weight loss and the ability to improve your body composition. And as a doctor who works all day, every day in term in managing diabetes and prediabetes, I can tell you body composition is king. It is where we need to go. We need to not only decrease body fat, but we need to increase our muscle, not only muscle mass, but even more so muscle metabolism. Now, back to the carnivore diet. It, it's not all sunshine and rainbows for those guys, these guys. One of the main problems is the lack of scientific evidence in favor of a carnivore diet and the overwhelming research, at least in the past, that supports the claim that it's not a good idea. Again, referring primarily to saturated fats. Now, today we're going to show you something that we haven't seen in other blog posts or other YouTube videos to date. Jesus has compiled a comprehensive list of evidence that we believe can make a case in favor of the carnivore diet. Now, this is such a flop, a flip flop, because Jesus and Miranda just less than a year ago uh, had a meeting with me to uh, talk to me about the carnivore diet and say, don't you realize the overwhelming evidence is against saturated fat and clearly this carnivore diet? Again, it was mostly driven by Miranda. And we've talked, she's made a lot of progress in terms of um, not coming to the other side, but understanding how to be flexible in terms of more of a Robert Lustig approach where we can say, look, we can, if you make your choice on whether you want to go carnivore, carnivore, omnivore, vegan, vegetarian, keto, however you want to do it, we're going to help you and assist you in getting your goals. So we're not trying to convince anybody to, uh, to adopt a carnivore diet uh, or to try it. I do think that trying different types of diets is a very educational and helpful experience. I'm currently trying a carnivore diet. I've been on a so, sort of a loose carnivore for the past three weeks. One of the interesting things that just happened was we got some of my labs back and yes, my APOB, my LDL doubled. Now, We'll talk about that later today if we can get around to it. We're going to go do a deep dive on this, um, but that's not today's topic. We'll be happy to answer questions on it, but today's topic is evidence-based perspectives on this diet. It's become very popular, and it's really become popular more based on people's uh, logic, uh, quote, content uh, creators' opinions, people's experience with it, but a lot of people do ask about the evidence. What's the evidence out there? So we'll review that today and we'll tell you what we, we do. We'll tell you what we're thinking about doing. And um, at the end, we'll do our traditional Q&A session. Now, remember to hit the subscribe button and become a member. So Jesus will let me answer your questions. Jesus? All right, Dr. Brewer. Wait, and, and, and there's Jeannie. Uh, Jeannie, if you want to say hi uh, real quick, right there. Uh, Jeannie will be joining us and we'll be discussing that. Jeannie, of course, she is our official translator. So anything anything that you don't understand from me or anything that Dr. Brewer just starts drifting away from the main topic, Jeannie will bring us back. <laughs> uh, Good to be here, Jesus. Thank you, Jeannie. <clears throat> wait, wait to throw me under the bus, Dr. Brewer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah i mean uh we're we're, we're kind of a scientist and uh we're, we try to find what the research will say and provide information on oh gilbert is messing up with me give me give me a second gilbert i, I want to show some things on the screen i love seeing dr Brewer and genie though but i need to show this um 
what I, I want you to see a little bit about the lens that we're using to describe the evidence that we're going to show uh, show you today about carnivore diet. We're not showing articles that discuss saturated fat only. So saturated fats alone, we are taking away that uh, assumption that saturated fat equals danger, and that means carnivore diet is dangerous. We're not discussing saturated fats. We're discussing meat and carnivore diet. So that's that's one of that one. What's one of the lenses? The other one is we're focusing on articles that discuss cardiovascular disease. So there's there are a couple of articles that will discuss benefits on autoimmune diseases and neurological disorders, but we're not covering those. We're focusing on cardiovascular disease. We are taking away any other article that supposed that, that says that carnivore diet is good because our ancestors used to eat that way and that's what the anthropological evidence says uh we're not we're not touching those and either and we're also not touching any other article that makes a claim in favor or against carnivore based on environmental perspectives and saying climate change and all that stuff we are basing this research uh this evidence research that we found solely on the relationship between meat and carnivore diet and cardiovascular disease. So that's that's what we're going to show you today. Let's just start with the very first one, the Nutrirex study. So this, the, and you can just Google the title of this, uh, each and every one of those. Most of them are open, open source. So what they found on this study or what they did is basically this is a clinical guideline where this researcher said, Okay, there, there are public guidelines that are saying that you should not be eating meat or just very little meat and do a plant-based diet based on the dangers available on the evidence. And there's there's likely some bias regarding the people who build the guidelines onto plant-based diet. And one main um, discussion that you will see on the carnivore field is that most of those people are not are not disclosing their biases. So there's a different group that disclose any bias that they might have. And this is the conclusion that they came out with after reviewing the evidence. So they reviewed the evidence and said on these guidelines, adults continue, should continue current on process and process red meat consumption. So they're saying that red meat is not dangerous or meat overall is not dangerous, but take a look at this. The weight of the evidence and the recommendation is just too weak. So it, the evidence is not strong enough to say carnivore diet is a bad thing, so you can still eat it, but the evidence is not strong enough to say that you should eat only meat. And that's that's kind of the conundrum that you will see over and over and over again. But this is kind of the first one. This is just the starting point to this. Now, the next point of conversation is meats don't have enough nutrients and people who are on an exclusive carnivore diet will lack plenty of nutrients on their diet. So let's talk about that. But before we do, before I tell you about what the evidence says about the nutrients, we're very happy to announce we are one week away from our Dallas event, our pop-up clinic, April the 18th to the 20th next week. Um, we have like very few spots available right now. And if you want to be able to join us, you're still on time. One week away, we'll see you in Dallas. We have a few spots in there. If you you might not be able to get your laps done before, but if you go in and sign up and we can help you to get all, every lab and get a follow-up consultation after the conference uh, on a different date with Dr. Brewer, um, you also have a chance to get a CIMT in place and overall, get information that you will not get anywhere else. So we have still a few spots available, but we're going to be in there next week on Dallas. And if you are already signed up, we're looking forward to meet you there. So don't miss out. Call 859-721-1414 or visit prevmedhealthevents.com. And don't miss this opportunity to get information that you won't get at your regular doctor office or even on YouTube. All right. So we're discussing nutrients and we're discussing why people think that carnivore diet is a good idea. So before we go to the nutrients, I have to show you, I have to show you this. The title of this next article is Beliefs and Experiences of Individuals Following a Zero Carb Diet, which is the 
uh, the previous name of a carnivore diet, a zero carb diet. Very interesting perspective because it summarizes what most people are doing about this. Uh, zero carb ha or carnivore diet has been thought of uh, the main to go diet to improve health. So that's why they're doing that. They're, usually, people on a carnivore diet have done have tried multiple things before and have not have not find success with those. There's a strong social identity and belongingness, if that's a word pronunciation. So basically, belonging to a group who shares your same values and do the same thing, that's very powerful. And to that point, we know that uh, when we when discuss vegan or carnivore diet, those are conflicting topics because of this specific point, and there's some kind of tribalism against it. So I'm just going to ask you to be nice in the comments. Uh, we're all trying to get healthier here. Then strong intentions to follow independently. So people feel better and they are willing to stay on it for longer periods of time because they feel better. There's a clear lack of support from healthcare providers and significant others because the evidence and what you get through every other places, social media, television, and the professional opinion from a lot of healthcare professionals is that's dangerous. You should not be doing that. There's some limit of access for some people. There's some high cost on foods, on some types of meat, but that doesn't have to be the case for all, all for all types of carnivore. There's plenty of, of, of examples on doing a low cost, low budget carnivore diet too. And the main point overall is the very last, the last bullet over here. There's limited scientific data on it. And this is one of the key issues and we're gonna discuss about what's our perspective on what's actually What's actually happening, and why don't you you don't find plenty of evidence on carnivore diet? Now, this is, or, yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah, uh, I was just gonna. Okay, I was just gonna try to translate some of that a little bit. Um, uh, we need that. The, well, I the only thing I wanted to say was that's why it's very specific to the patient, and that's why we don't take a stand anywhere because it depends on someone's needs and how their metabolism works and whether. A specific diet works better for them or not. And we are able to watch that in lab work and in all different ways. And that's why we don't claim any specific one. And I guess maybe Dr. Brewer, that's why you were talking about doing some experimentation with different things to see what works for people, right? You are on me, Dr. Brewer. Sorry about that. I do think a lot of the uh, I, we're awash again in a sea of insulin, which is killing us because we're so many of us are awash in a sea of uh, processed carbs. So anything that can help us restrict those processed carbs, I think is a good thing. And um, you see both of that. You see that in a carnivore diet. You can even see that in a vegan diet. It's a little bit simpler and easier in a carb. Uh, carnivore diet. And I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing a lot of this increasing popularity on it right now, especially for that crowd that grew up eating um, Captain Crunch twice a day. Mm -hmm. or what, what is Tony the Tiger? Uh, Processed plates. plates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Getting plenty of niacin. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. We call we call those sucaritas over here the sugar eaters. Oh, sucaritas. Yeah. Sugar eaters. So yeah. All right. So let's talk about nutrients on a carnivore diet. There's a one. There's a really good review from uh, Dr. O'Horn, and this review is saying the following: uh, requirements will always vary on every individual. So if you based your idea that you're nutrient deficient because of a standard recommendations on each nutrient. You might be wrong. Everybody has some specific requirement. Uh, acute micronutrient needs can be met without plants, but there is no long-term data. So the same problem over and over again on, we have short-term data, but we don't have long-term data. Uh, essential nutrients are available, but not always in high levels. So that's a big problem too. So you will find a lot of that stuff on meat, but probably you are going to be needing to eat a lot of car, uh, carnivore or meat sources to accomplish those requirements. And in this review, they were concerned about calcium specifically, but there's also other evidence that suggests iodine, B12, magnesium, and even fiber 
fiber is a whole point of discussion that we're going to cover in another time. But those those nutrients uh, are a problem also that can be encountered when you try a carnivore diet. So to be considered. Overall, it's not it's not nutrition lacking, but there are some stuff that you want to consider, and that happens in every restrictive diet out there. Uh, Dr. Bird, you were ready to say something. No, I wasn't. Oh, okay. So <laughs> my, my reading people skills is deteriorating over time. Uh, <laughs> Maybe you right. need to take a course. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that just goes too, too deep and too, no, no time to that discussion today, Jeannie. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's a good point. Uh, but now let's talk about risk. So this is the first article that I wanted to show you about benefits and risk associated with meat consumption. And the overall conclusion of this paper was the following. Red meat provides valuable proteins and nutrients, so that's checked. They do recommend that children, young women, and elderly people consume meat, especially on the setting of anemia because of the lack of iron. And, and somebody in the comments is reminding me, and you're right, uh, I'm going to do this because this is key for the previous point. Vitamin C is also deficient that you can encounter on carnivore diet. Thank you for reminding me. And the other point that you will find on the research is there's there's few research regarding carnivore diet and overall few research regarding carnivore diet on elderly folks. So that's another point to consider. Uh, there might be some chronic disease, risk, diabetes, hypertension, blood high blood pressure, but the evidence is, is weak too. White meat is neutral, and it's even associated with lower cardiovascular risk. There are some papers that say that poultry is actually a protective factor as long as fish. But there is a need to provide some in-depth guidelines regarding meat intake for the overall population and help clear out the confusion regarding if you should be eating meat or not. So as you see, no clear definition in favor or against. Now, carnivore long-term, there's one research that's try, trying to explore what the effects are on a carnivore diet on the long way, on the long-term. This is based on a bigger study called the Preview study. So the downside from this, this is not a carnivore exclusive uh, research either. What they did is they got 688 adults between 26 and 70 years old with overweight and pre-diabetes. They did eight weeks of a low energy diet induced weight loss where they lost at least 8% of the body fat or the weight, 8% of, of their weight. And the results are the following. What they found out is that those people who went in and lose weight at the beginning, for each 10 grams of meat that they eat, processed meat, they, de they did regain some of that weight and that weight circumference. There was no association with unprocessed meat, poultry, dairy, and eggs. And fish and seafood actually decreased their triglycerides. So what they're saying is over time, uh, intake of meat is not necessarily associated with the increase of weight and other risk factors. Only processed meat on this one. There's no kind of relationship in favor or against and actually, on processed meat. Uh, what, well, Jesus, I mean, what's the difference between processed and unprocessed? Are you talking bologna? Or are you talking hamburger? That's a really good question, also, because pro the, the the meat the process of uh, on the meats is very different. It's usually salting and putting some uh, chemicals in there for the food to last longer. So every company who processes meat will do have a different perspective, but basically. The big difference is if you're getting it, if you're getting it raw from uh, uh, organic market, if you want to call them that way, or if you're gonna getting them from the store or from the uh, refrigerated items uh, on the supermarket. So fish and seafood came on top on this one, not poultry though. And the next one, uh, there, there's like three more articles that we need to go through. And this is what is available. The, this meta-analysis was really interesting because they were including randomized control trials that involved meat consumption and various cardiovascular factors. 
And the overall outcome from this meta-analysis, which is one of the uh, more powerful ways to do research, if they include good good uh, papers on it, they included 36 uh, articles since 2017 to the 20 uh, until two, 2017. There was no significant differences between red meat and LDL, HDL, APOA1, APOB, and blood pressure. Red meat actually improved LDL and HDL better than fish and triglycerides uh, in comparison with carbs. And there's no surprise right there. High quality plant protein decreased cholesterol, LDL, LDL cholesterol, and total cholesterol more than red meat. So this is a key point because if you base your cardiovascular risk on LDL and total cholesterol, plant-based diet will come on top. And they will tell you plant-based is the way to go because you decrease APOB and LDL. Therefore, there is a, need, a decrease on risk, cardiovascular risk. And that's the whole point about all this problem with carnivore diet. And at least this meta-analysis is showing that red meat does have some improvements on some cardiovascular factors. The problem is everybody is defining carnivore differently. Everybody's measuring carnivore differently. So even in a meta-analysis, when you have 36 different studies, it's hard to come to a conclusion because each study is different using different methods. So that's kind of the downside from, from this one. The other one is effects of low carbohydrate diets high in red meats or poultry, fish, and shellfish on plasma lipids and weight loss. And what they found in this one was when they compare low carbohydrate diets with red meat versus low carbohydrate diets with uh, poultry, fish, in only 18 subjects, so this is a small study, after 28 days, both diets decrease weight similarly. Even the fish-based diet decreased weight a little bit more, but neither diet was associated with significant changes in total cholesterol, LDL, but the good thing is both diets decrease triglycerides. And the big point here is that maybe it wasn't the meat itself. Maybe it was the lack of carbohydrates. And most of the benefits on these diets come from good enough processed grains, processed carbohydrates out of your diet. And I think that's one of the main benefits. And the last one that I have for you, and then we can go into discussion from deeper stuff, is health effects associated with consumption of often processed meat a burden proof of study. So this is kind of uh, the overall take on what's available. And Dr. Burr would like this one. The senior author, one of the senior authors of this one. Oh, no, it's the next one. I'm sorry. I have the senior author on the next one. So this is not the one. But let me show you this first. They included 70, 37 cohorts and one nested case control, which basically says that they follow a specific people. This is not epidemiology following large amount of people, populations. They had people follow up over time. They found that evidence is not consistent either against or in favor. There is weak evidence of on processed meat causing cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, which is another uh, discussion point when saying carnivore diet is dangerous. The evidence is not strong enough to support that claim. On processed meats are not associated with heart attacks and strokes. <clears throat> and the problem with this might be that if you are eating carnivore diet because it's not dangerous. Uh, that's one way to do it, but it's also the evidence is not there to say it's actually the best healthy option. And now to what I wanted to show Dr. Burr. This one, Dr. David Ludwig uh, was also, oh God, I have so many research for you guys. David Ludwig is not on this one either, but this is comparing vegetarian fish, poultry, and meat eaters with cardiovascular mortality. 8.5 years follow-up, over 100,000 participants, over 94% meat eaters on this one. Vegetarians had a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. People who eat fish have a lower incidence of cardiovascular disease to heart attacks and stroke. But there was no increased mortality with any diet. The downside from this study is they were not exclusive carnivores. This is people who is including meat on their diets. So also grain of salt on this one because or pinch of salt because this is these are not exclusive carnivores. They're just including carnivore diet on their meat. And now finally, 
Dr. David Ludwig, the senior author of this article. What, what's the book Dr. Ludwig wrote, Dr. Brewer? Always Hungry. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's talking about people with prediabetes because they're in that uh, oxidative state, a wash in insulin, and that insulin's always dropping their blood sugar. It's always creating hunger. It's the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. And so he wrote a whole book. The first half of his book was, I think it was either the first half or the second half. Half of the book was about the hormones that create obesity or overweight and this battle to maintain your weight. And then this, the other half of the book was how to just totally clean out your kitchen, go to the grocery store and reset your lifestyle at home for more of a low carb lifestyle. He runs the... Uh, ran the, um, the obesity treatment unit at Harvard. He's a, like Robert Lustig, he's a pediatric endocrinologist. So uh, everybody confuses those two guys. They're uh, carb insulin model um, obesity managers. They're, they're both researchers. They're both um, pediatric endocrinologists and they're, uh, they both ran um, obesity units in large academic centers. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. So he was the senior author on this article. And this is probably one of the best pieces of evidence that you will find. And it still has some problems. So they, the title is Behavioral Characteristics and Self, Self-Reported Health Status Among 2029 Adults Consuming Carnivore Diet. And I think probably this is the best way you can do research on a population doing a carnivore diet. They are, this is people that are already doing that. And from the, those 2029 subjects, after 14 months of carnivore, red meat consumption was daily or more often by 84%. So 85% of them were, were eating meat once a day. They, the people who reported adverse symptoms was less than 1%. And 95% reported an overall improvement on their health. They increased their BMI by a median of three points. The LDL average is 172, HDL 68, and triglycerides is 68. So if you go to a cardiologist, they will tell you that LDL is very dangerous. You should be a stop, just to stop eating um, just meat. And they will probably take high triglyceride with high LDL anytime. And we are a little bit on the other side of the aisle and saying that we, we will take a lower triglyceride over a, over a low LDL. 0.4% reduction in A1C, which is, might not be significant on the A1C part. 84% of them stop taking oral, the anti-diabetic medication, and 100% of them stop taking injected anti-diabetic medications because of the improvement on their, on their values. And again, I don't think that's because they are eating meat. I think that's because they stop, they stop eating carbs. Could I interrupt for a second? Uh, yeah, Dr. Brewer, this is my show today. You have oh, been very okay. quiet today. And okay. I'm, I'm, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you're interrupting me. Go ahead. <laughs> two, two points, you know, the, look at those last two points. Uh, they stopped their diabetes medications and still got a half a percentage decrease in A1C. So it may not sound like much in, the, in terms of the half a percent decrease, but then when you put it in terms of, yeah, and they stopped their diabetes medication, that gives you a whole different perspective on that third point. They stopped their diabetes medication and they achieved further significant decrease in A1C. The other point I wanted to make it was a discussion I was having this morning, and that is uh, so many people get so wrapped around their axle wanting to, especially the, 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 the detractors, the guys that want to argue about meat and saturated fat. I think the the major advantage to a carnivore diet is not so much that you're eating meat. It's that it's such a simple and easy button for getting rid of carbs. And that is what our issue is. Carbs. Definitely. And I was just discussing with Jeannie um, 
one one thing one perspective before before we wrap it up and go to other um, closing remarks that I want to hear from you and Jeannie, Dr. Brewer. I will give you mine first uh, because I'm that narcissistic. And uh, <laughs> the the uh, the problem that I see with carnivore research is that there is just so much evidence that says that saturated fats and carnivore diet is bad that I think that very few research committees will approve a, a study where they where you are putting on purpose people on carnivore diet. They will think that it's dangerous and that's unethical and that you can't do that. That's why I'm saying that this this research from uh, Lenners and et al. and Dr. Ludwig, it's probably one of the best things that you can do because you can only take people who are already doing carnivore diet. You cannot make them do it because of research. And that alone is also what we call selection bias because we are putting people that are doing that because they believe on that diet and the results might be confounding at the end. Uh, so it's it's difficult to make the research on any type of diet more than on the, more in the carnivore diet. So if you're waiting for the perfect research to support it, as Dr. Burr said on the last, uh, I think was on the last short, um, you will be waiting forever. Uh, so um, that's that's kind of a, my my takeaway. And before we go to Dr. Brewer's closing remarks and his own perspective on carnivore diet and Jeannie's perspective on carnivore diet, I just need to remind you: we'll be on Dallas, Texas next week. We're hoping to see you there. We have few spots available. Don't miss out. This is a once in a lifetime experience that you don't want to miss out, and you will get information that you won't get anywhere else. Information that will help you uh, get your life on track or do those tweaks that you need to improve your life even further. So don't miss out. Call 859-721-1414 or visit PredMedHealthEvents.com. All right. So let's go ahead and discuss. Can I, I can I go ahead and answer tech? Well, just remind me to uh, answer tech ADSR a little bit later. Uh, th th go ahead. Uh, he's a member, so I'll approve that. Thank you very much, Mr. Answer Nazi. So Tech ADSR, that's such a, a great question. I used to get confused on that as well. When, and I'm, I'm sort of Captain Literal. Uh, when you say it's a 0.5% increase, are you talking about 5.9 down to 5.5 or 5.9 down to 5.8? No, it, it, we're talking about a percentage increase. So 5.9 down to 5.5. It's a very significant number. Uh, a five percentage off of that percent would not be significant. We're yeah, talking about exactly. that, the original percentage. Yeah, and you get that. I mean, I know that there were some context missing on all of this because if I want to show you all of those papers in 20 minutes, things are going to uh, go through the cracks on some of the details. So the papers are right there. Um, probably I'm going to be able to ask the team to put the links on the description for you to go visit them yourself. Um, and as any paper, any research will have some flaws. But again, I think we these papers are showing that they're not necessarily biased in favor of carnivore. They're actually showing a very measured interpretation of the information and saying some people are doing good on it and it's not necessarily the best diet overall. But you cannot deny that people are, are seeing benefits of doing this diet by itself. And I think it's mostly because they're cutting carbs. Jeannie? Well, do you want to translate just... or, or go ahead and give your perspective on this one before we go to QA? Yeah, I just think, again, there's so many variables. Every person's different. Their genetics are different. Their environmental factors are different. Their history is different. Their disease processes are different. And their issues are different. So, I think that's why there's never going to be a one thing fits everyone. And that's why you have to go specific and look at specific things to help um, people go. Yeah, I mean, we, we try to support whatever diet someone's on and keeping them healthy and um, full, having full nutrition and everything else during it. And I mean, I don't think there's any way to tell if it works for you unless you experiment with it. But that's my take. Wonderful. Dr. Brewer, before we go to Q&A, any additional comments? Oh, I was hoping you'd ask. So to your last comment, Jesus, about 
um, randomized clinical trials. It, it, JMK made a point about, oh, there is no such thing as food science. It's all um, proprietary, uh, uh, money-based, et cetera, et cetera. And although I would agree with that, as Jesus said, there's an, there's at least there's two other really big problems. One is how are you going to randomize people to a diet? The only way you can do that is bring them into a food center or a research center and control what they eat. And that's a big problem. Those are very expensive. There are a few of those studies. Uh, at some point during this show, I want to spoil the beans on next week's show and talk a little bit about one of those studies where uh, where people looked at that. Jenny Rule, I'm a big Jenny Rule fan. She wrote um, the oh, what's the name of her website? Blood Sugar 101. Yeah, Blood Sugar 101. She's a, it's a very good um, book as well as website, award-winning website, talking about uh, diabetes and how to manage it, different components of it. She did a good summary on um, just a few years ago on the food science, the food epidemiology, the diet epidemiology uh, literature that was out there. And she made a really good point. And that is, I, we're driven by our food behavior. And that has to do with you know, Robert Lustig talks about several things. One is, you know, energy, energy balance model, the carbohydrate and in insulin model, the, um, the uh, oxidative model, which we work with all day, every day in terms of folks that have prediabetes and diabetes. Then he goes into talking about the uh, obesogens in the environment like DDT and he didn't even mention the biggest driver out there, and that is behavior. So back to Jenny Rule's comment, the, the, the diet, the, the best diet is the one that works for you. And that is the problem. That's similar to what Jenny was saying, and that's the truth. You've got to find a diet that is going to work for you. And just, you know, and that's part of what we do. We, we, patients meet with, with me and the other, with, and Jeannie and, and Heather, and then they, they're, we're setting up a program. The biggest need we've had is not so much the theory that, you, uh, that we get and, and a lot of practical information that we get, but the day-to-day, -day, weekly, co monthly coaching activities to help people problem solve and say, okay, this is what, my lifestyle is. This is what I like. This is what I can live with on a regular basis. Because if you can't, uh, you, you when you looked at Jenny Rule's uh, diets, for example, by far the biggest issue was whether or not somebody could stay with a diet for six months. Mm -hmm. If you cannot stay with a diet for six months, you really need to consider whether that diet's for you. If you're suffering your diet, that yeah. maybe not not the best for you. And I think that happens all the time with population because the people who watch this channel are in a special group. You are people who want to improve your health and that you're willing to do the work to do some research on your own and find information that you have not been able to find with your local doctor or nurse. And um, and that's why you're here. But most folks like the overall population, they're dependent on what their doctors say. And when their doctors say, hey, you should stop eating this and start eating that, and that's a very restrictive diet where they are not allowed to have an opinion or try to do something different, they're very likely fail and go back to the processed foods and go back to the things that are making them sick. So if you're in this channel, you're probably not in that population anymore you are looking for solutions. But a lot of the people out there are in depth on the carb addiction that is killing most people. So that's why sharing this, this information is very, very important. And to Dr. Bruce's point, I believe if your first diet to go into improving your health and avoiding that carb addiction, and that's vegan or carnivore, I'll be okay with any of those as the first step to cut your carb addiction. 
And as you learn and get adapted, you can you can modify and adjust your diet as you as you can and start introducing some carbs. Um, but I think that's why it's it's different for everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the Q&A and solve of the YouTube member questions only, as I do. So a big shout out to Juan Son, who just became a member. Remember, you can become a member by clicking next to the subscribe button where it says join. This is not due to premium. This is becoming a PrepMed Health channel member. So we can get to your questions first, unless I don't see Dr. Brewer answering questions in the back. Uh -oh. So uh, uh, you will get an icon next to your name, just like Juan over here. Uh, I appreciate your support and we appreciate everybody who is in here. This is just to get some order on how we answer questions, but we'll try to get most of uh, the questions that we have here. Dr. Brill already answered some of those. He's, he's a good man. Uh, Rick Folia, carnivore got, me, got my life back. A1C, triglycerides, HDL, glucose, insulin, weight, all perfect now. Of all meds, haven't felt this good in 40 years. That's what we're talking about. And that's Dr. Ludwig's research on people feel good on this diet. And what would you say is the main downside of it? LDL and total cholesterol, Dr. Brewer? Dr. Brewer doesn't want to talk today with you guys. That's what he's saying. Uh, but yes, <laughs> I think that, that high LDL happens, but it also happens with any kind of really low-carb diet. It's exactly. not just carnivore. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have your lean mass hyperresponder will, that will have a tremendous increase on LDL. And that's not necessarily because of a carnivore diet. It's mostly because their metabolism is wired into lacking carbs will cause them to increase their LDL. And uh, those guys, they failed, but Nick Norwood also have a couple of really interesting papers where they are showing that at least on the uh, on the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype, uh, it's not the saturated fats, actually, what is increasing their LDL. It's the lack of carbs. It's the low carbs. And the other thing is, it's not at all clear that that increase in LDL is, is conferring risk. In okay. fact, the, uh, every piece of evidence so far indicates that it's not increasing risk. Yeah. The other, Which, the other thing that I, I have seen people saying, will, will the lean mass hyperresponder evidence apply to everybody or just them say that again yeah so the evidence mean? the evidence evidence on lean mass hyperresponders with high ldl being not at a higher risk will apply to everybody or just them oh well obviously that really you know so for the lean mass hyperresponder that's a very interesting question you know for the nick norwitz's of and dave feldman's of the world that's obviously a big question but you're right. That's what really gets me very interested. So you're going to tell me that LDL doesn't make uh, Aline, doesn't make Nick Norwitz or Dave Feldman at greater risk. Then why does it make somebody else at greater risk? Yep. And then you have your familial hypercholesterolemia patients with high levels of LDL that do have high risk. So yes, you do. we don't we don't know for sure. That's why evidence is is going in there. And I'm gonna give another shout out. Thank you to uh, is that Banger one who just became a YouTube member. Thank you so much. Uh, that means that when we have new YouTube members on the channel, that's that means we're doing something good. And I appreciate we appreciate that. Uh, let me see. Take ADSR. Where would I get my caffeine liquid start in the morning at 100% carnivore? <laughs> I think he's, he or she is being facetious a little bit, right? So uh, yeah. if, you're, carniv if you're, you're, you're carnivore, you're not allowed to eat caffeine, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> hey, sis, I'm sorry. I, I felt like we left late. We left that last item hanging about. Uh, I we did. We did I'm about sorry. lean mass hyper responder. So, what if if a if FH for those of you who are interested and are aware of it, FH stands for familial hypercholesterolemia. It's a genetic disease where. Um, it's a, it, it's not really clear what, how many families have it. It appears to be in the area of one in 300 to one in 500. Most doctors are not aware of it. They just see a high LDL and they react the way they always do about a high LDL. We get a lot of those because we talk about them and we get patients from all over the world. Um, and we've been pretty clear that the real risk appears with these LDL levels 500 and greater. Uh, there does appear to be some risk, uh, three to 500, but not really so much, uh, in those, those lesser groups. The places where we start to see risk is those folks that have those FH levels, what we would call heterozygous or garden variety or regular type one, you got one, one gene from mom, but not, or, or dad, but not a gene from both. Uh, those folks tend to do well until they start have, getting uh, into their 50s, start getting insulin resistance. And so, <clears throat> uh, but you look at the, what, the homozygous, the kids that got a, an FH gene from mom and another one from dad, and again, three to 500 and above, they start getting into significant issues. They start getting heart attacks in their teens and twenties. So it is clear that something about an extremely high LDL can cause danger. But then you turn around and you look at a lean mass hyper responder who gets to 300, 350. There's little to no evidence that this, uh, that this person is at higher risk. Um, you, uh, to go deeper into that debate, there's a, a fellow, what is his, what's the guy's name that wrote the article about, about, um, looking at APOB Snyderman. Tom, is it Tom mm -hmm. Snyderman? I think so. He wrote a, 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 an extensive article reviewing all the evidence and literature around, uh, APOB. And where they were going is APOB includes all of the other types of particles, not just LDL, but IDL, VLDL, chylomicrons, those particles that have huge amounts of triglyceride in them. And those particles do have significant conferred risk for um, cardiovascular disease. I've probably done, I've probably confused the heck out of everybody. Maybe I should be quiet. Maybe one of you should help translate for me. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that you can confuse people more than me. <laughs> so you got me confused. Uh, Jeannie, did you, can, 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 you, can you can you can, can you give us a can you give us a down to earth translation from Dr. Brewer? I'm gonna try, but I got lost a little bit. But I think that what you're trying to say is for the lean mass hyper responders and with the high levels of LDL, is this making things more dangerous or for other people is that applying and we're just not sure and we need more research. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And let me, and actually let me, so here's the thing. We do know that a homozygous FH, uh, they have significant danger and it does appear to be from LDL, but that's in one in 40,000 people. That's not everyday high LDL. Uh, on the other hand, you look at uh, lean mass, even lean, lean mass hyper responders. Those are people who have what was the average jesus for that last study was it I, 270 I oh oh you mean uh, the average of the ldl yeah yeah i think it was yeah, 270. 270 270 that's one in a thousand mm -hmm. and you would expect those people they've been on uh carnivore i mean uh lo, very low carb diet keto diet for an average of what five years so if that was causing cardiovascular disease stress, you'd see a whole, you'd expect to see a whole lot of plaque and you didn't. So well, go ahead. I, I was just thinking, you know, for years, for years, even still, they, it, you know, 200 carbs or 250 carbs was kind of the recommendation for, from the 
cardiologists. And so for a long time, no one even really knew about the lean mass ever responders because no one really had the diets that expose that. It's kind of what I've understood over time is that you can't yeah. really tell if you're one until you take everything out of the equation. Well, people weren't doing that. So now they are. Exactly. So now there's some research, but this is new. And because keto and low carb is so popular now, they're coming out of the woodwork. Exactly right. Somebody said that. Somebody said, oh, you cannot use the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype as an example because there's just, it's a unicorn. There's not that many people with that. Uh, we're not sure. Mm, maybe not. There, maybe there's maybe a lot not. of people that we were, mm -hmm. we just, they just had a high LDL levels and that was their problem. They were on statins and, mm -hmm. And we that, that was the only metabolic issue that they were dealing with. So, mm -hmm. yep. And so I think until that's the thing is that you, until you take all that out of the equation and do it, can you start even identifying if you're in that category? Right. And because yep. we, we see it a lot when people yeah, didn't know and then they take it all out and then we say, okay, well, this is what's going on here. So yep. interesting. I'll, pro I'll probably go vegan for a while if wanna, I want to test that just to take out of the equation the confounder of saturated fats being the cause. And mm -hmm. then you can just do a test of a few few time with vegan and then do a little bit of carnivore and see if that increases your LDL or not. Yeah. Well, and we've had, I know that we've had patients that, that were vegans for years and then it didn't work. And so they, they've switched and they, and then we have people that do something else for years and then they switch. And that's why I think you have to see what works per individual, oh, yeah. but it takes a lot of time and testing and labs and, you know, digging oh yeah definitely and the other side is if you're if you're eating carnivore and you're eating too much calories uh and eating too much meat that does that's not necessarily a good thing either you're gonna still gain weight doctor you you had kind of that experience right dr Burr, at some moment increasing your meat intake and actually gaining weight i did um but my, my original problem was I increased the meat, but I didn't decrease the carbs. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Definitely. That was a few years ago. Quite a few years ago. The last last year. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, 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 no. no one last so, year. Uh, take ADSR. Why does the study qualify plant quality? Does it similarly qualify red meat, perhaps grass fed and finished? It doesn't. And that's a really good point <laughs> that I wanted to cover. Thank you. There's limited research regarding. On processed versus processed meat, and it's controversial. It's conflicting. And then there's some evidence regarding grass-fed, which might have low, a higher omega-3 fatty acids compared to other types of meat. But in that specific study, this is what they labeled as high-quality plants. And a lot of people uh, on, on the audience might have a stroke after you hear this. <laughs> Legumes, nuts, and soy. And I know how people feel about soy. So... That's what they mm -hmm. were comparing that to. And they make a case, soy will decrease LDL and total cholesterol better than meat. Yeah, probably. Uh, is that is that what you are looking for? Your cardiologist or your doctor might be what they're looking for. So uh, Decreasing but, LDL. Decreasing LDL, but we want to yeah. see the whole picture, right? Yeah. Joey T, after significant lifestyle change, for 1.5 years, low carb, healthy fat, ex exercise, BMI 35 to 26. Wow, that's really impressive. I still have high small LDL particles. Will saturated fat increase or decrease the small LDL particle? That's a really good question, Dr. Brewer. I think it has two answers. There are two answers to that question, right, Dr. Brewer? What are they? Oh, God. Well, I was I was hoping you'd tell us. The first one is... I think evidence is still conflicting. I think there's some evidence that will say, yes, saturated fats will increase the small, L, a small dense LDL. That's the small LDL particle. But there is also plenty of research that say, even though small dense LDL plays a role in oxidation and inflammation that creates plaque, measuring the small LDL particles over time is not significantly associated with cardiac events or risk itself. So. Yes, but we are not sure that actually something that matters at the end. Do, will you agree with that or, or so, I'm yeah, on the other uh, side of the aisle? So I was letting you go first because I was trying to translate in my head oh, oh, okay. uh, what, what the three of us do on a daily basis. Because I think a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is over, is over a lot of people's head in terms of 
either the clinical side of what we do. If this stuff sounds a little bit confusing, here's a couple of key issues. Number one, if you drop your carbs way low, it's been shown in the past that your LDL can often go up. Now, you, many of us have heard multiple times, it's the small, dense LDL that's dangerous. Um, so the labs don't really present uh, uh, what you, so now what you've got is, do I have a large increase in my overall LDL or am I losing my large, uh, my large fluffy LDL? I realize I'm starting to get confusing as well. <laughs> Dr. Rue likes to go into bunny holes, and it's been a while since we let them do the bunny hole thing, so I can understand. What that. you're saying, what you're saying is, we don't know until we see you as a patient and look at your labs and advise you, and you try it, and we see if it works. Yes, and, and but again, let me try one more time. Well, I'm going to we're going to do a better job explaining that next week on the conference. Just so you know, we're going to we are. dedicate time for that specific point. But go ahead, Dr. Burr, give it a shot. So there are, I, I'm far less concerned about somebody that goes low carb and they have an increase in small dense LDL than I am someone who has loss of their large fluffy LDL. Does that make sense? It does. So there's a difference between a small dense particles, LDL particles versus large fluffy LDL particles. So Small LDNs, uh, small dense LDL particles are not as high risk as is having low large LDL particles. You want large LDL particles which are are less inflammatory and actually will give you some protection factor. And I tell you what, this is not all our fault. The unfortunately, life can be complicated. Then and the labs don't. They they used to show the bell curve. Uh, and what you really want to make sure is that you're not losing the large fluffy LDL. Yeah. yeah I, and Joey T has a comment on that. I have read that small LDL can no longer get processed by the liver because it's too small. All I read is how to prevent creating it, but I already have a lot of small LDL. How can I get rid of it? So well, Joey T, let me just suggest again that uh, a, that we look at a fractionation, and B, that we focus more on your large fluffy LDL right now than your small dense. I will tell you how, and you wouldn't like the answer. High dose of statins. That would do it. That would do it. Anytime your LDL well, is below that's 70. That's going to decrease his LDL overall, for sure. Yeah, exactly. But it's going to impact also the large LDL. And it may mess with his metabolic health will cause insulin resistance. Yeah, which is worse. So there's a balance to be made in there. Right. Uh, now, now, now I wonder why people are getting high doses of statins all the time on, their, on the medical office, right? Right. And PT and JB, currently eating less than 8 grams of carbs, protein 100 to 110 grams, rest is fat. A stage 2 to 3 kidney disease, PCP wants me to restrict protein. How does carnivore diet? Deal with, deal with this issue. That's a really good point. I'm interested to see your opinion, Dr. Burr. I have my own, but I'm interested to see yours. Well, I mean, again, you guys are there with me, you know, and I, I was answering that question from someone else a few minutes ago saying, uh, what do you do about a carnivore diet for somebody that's got significant kidney disease? Stage one or two, for sure, is not that much of an issue. Once you start getting into stage threes and certainly four and five, that's where you start getting into significant questions about protein restriction. And uh, someone else responded and said, oh, that's not real. That's not a concern. Yes, it is. With people with very significant kidney, uh, stage three, four, five kidney failure, especially four and five, Carnivore diet is an issue. Yes, and that's why, <clears throat> because the too much protein there is, is difficult, right? And so, but that's why it's, nothing works for everyone because there's other issues involved that we have to take into account. H have you heard of alpha keto analogs? Mm. Alpha keto analogs, some are, are a type of protein that is a medication level, medication level substance that it's, it, although has amino acids on it, 
is not entirely metabolized by the kidney compared to other meat sources. Hmm, I haven't heard of that. So you can use that as a protein supplement or, or amino acid source for people with or kidney disease and kidney decrease disease. the risk of having protein try to be put out through your kidney that is already injured. So I agree with that. A lot of people would tell you, no, carnivore diet doesn't cause kidney disease. I can agree with that. I don't think it's the main cause. I think the main cause of kidney disease either. is diabetes and it. insulin resistance. No. But if you're already diabetes. have kidney disease, you have to be careful about your protein intake. And those alpha keto analogs are a good option for those population. Of course, you need to talk to a doctor to prescribe those. And uh, as often, we touched on a couple of items, but we probably we probably didn't hit the real point for PT and DJB. Um, for somebody with significant enough uh, kidney failure, and yes, kidney failure is usually caused by diabetes, not by proteins. It's just that you can't eat that much protein at that point. It's not a, it, it's not a huge issue. Uh, again, the, the in our mind, or at least in my mind, the major benefit of a carnivore diet is not eating meat. It's eating low carbs. So, somebody with uh, with a an amino acid or protein restriction just needs to eat more uh, of a um, of a low protein, low carb diet, which is adding more fats in and decreasing the, the protein. That's all. Yeah. Or they can go vegan or a little bit more plant based. Oh my goodness, that. heaven forbid! Well, the carnivores are going to roll over. That's a point for plant based. I, I gotta say. Uh, I would do some. I do want to say, by the way, we had a few sn uh, snarky comments coming out, but uh, both of us made a couple of requests to play nice, and we're getting a lot of playing nice. I am just so pleasantly surprised. Uh, we appreciate that, guys. We we don't we want really to do. over here on the chat comments. As as we said, everybody's trying to get healthy, and the solution for one people might not be the solution for the other folk. So that's just the way it is. What diet guidelines are best to help go from small LDL to large LDL molecules? I think the, the closest you can get is with LDL, uh, with a low carb diet. Yeah. But, but it's not only the diet, you have to do the work. So exercise also plays a big role on improving those numbers. And and Dr. Bird didn't say anything, so I guess he approves. Uh, well, I was looking at Lynn Carl Carleton's question. I know she's not a or he or she's not not a member. Not a member? A, how long how do you, you provide doctor services in Ohio? We already have patients in Ohio. We're licensed there. We, so give us a call. Uh, Dr. Gilbert, you can put the number over there so they can give us a call. 859-721-1414. Dr. Dr. Brewer, Jeannie, Heather provide services through telemedicine. And uh, we have available service on all the U.S., and abroad. So uh, if you're in Mexico, contact me. The in-mass hyperspender is not just high LDL. The definition includes the triad of high HDL and low triglyceride. Yes, that's exactly what we're saying. How many people have that triad? They are not obese. They are not overweight. They are on a low-carb diet. They have high HDL, low triglycerides, but the LDL went through the roof, and the doctor is not picking it up. How many years have that passed by? I don't think that's something necessarily new. I don't think that's something that just happened five years ago. I think there's plenty of people that were dealing with that. And it's getting more popular now. Oh, you know, and it's not just uh, crazy internet people. Yeah, it was it was on the web about, what, 10 years ago. And it was the um, the head of cardiology at Harvard was saying, yeah, this is a known thing. We see people with that drop their, that decrease their carbs and their LDL goes way up. And it's not necessarily sure, uh, clear that they're at risk. That's for sure. That's for sure. Uh, Tree Lady also says, my S small LDL gradually rose over 20 years of low carb diet with after lipid markers sustained the same. So assuming age comes into a play as a cause. Uh, LDL, anytime LDL is over 70, your small LDL is going to be high. That's, that's kind of a given. That's uh, what I but, was, pardon the interruption, but that's what I was trying to say to the, whoever it was that was asking a few minutes ago. Well, that's one of those weird times when I can translate for you, Dr. Burr. Thank you so much. And, uh, but age, of course, age plays a big, 
big role on this again. And I would like to, uh, unless you have something on, on this one, I have to, I would like to tackle a couple of questions and then we should wrap it up because we're on a one hour, one, 10 minutes. Uh, Blue pool, confused on carnivore, milk, cheese, tuna, salad, cold beer, eggs. It has to be more than steak. Sometimes I'm confused too, because there is no clear guideline on carnivore. It's simple if you only eat any type of meat or meat uh, derived source, like milk and dairy. But as you include other stuff, it gets a little bit more complicated. And if you're only eating steak, that's just one type of carnivore diet to include. God forbid you are eating raw liver as that liver king guy who ended up being a fraud. Uh, we're not talking about that carnivore diet. But eating organs also has some benefit if you cook them right, of course. Ginny doesn't like the organs. I like my liver with onions and lime. So, Dr. Bird, do you have an opinion on, on that? That's a big deal. Uh, I think cold beer does not fit in the carnivore diet, The for sure. Then milk, uh, most carnivores would say stay away from just regular milk. Um, and it's got it's got some lactose carbs in it. But oh, yeah. uh, anything, the cheese, tuna salad, eggs. Yeah, I think most carnivores agree with that. But that was part of that's part of my biggest beef with carnivore anyway. Pardon the pun, not intended. Um, <laughs> it should have been intended. It is that uh, people talk carnivore and they don't define it. I uh, would yeah. define it. Uh, I would define a carnivore as including uh, eggs, tuna salad, cheese, uh, and more of a low carb milk or, or like a half and half cream kind of thing. Dr. Bird, you should be honest and say that your carnivore diet is having eggs. Yeah, well, I am. I mean, uh, Jesus brought, I mentioned it earlier too. So for me, it's, it is simple. I, I bought one of these big spiral hams and, you know, like three times a day, I go to the refrigerator and get a whole bunch of ham and, and, except for breakfast. And then I have eggs with my ham. So it's not yeah. quite that bad. And I am branching out. I'm adding sausage now and a few things. Uh, yeah. And I do have my little cheats and vacations, especially over uh, anniversary and uh, and uh, Easter celebration. But yeah, uh, the, here's a, another thing. A, a good point for folks that are not aware. I have never shown uh, significant ketones except for two times. Number one, when I went on a five day fast. I don't know if we're going to do a video on that that one that experience or not. At least not yet. I went to the highest level of ketones. It surprised me because I've never, I've done fasting, prolonged fasting for years and never saw significant ketones. I suspected that it was a urine ketone thing. And sure enough, when I went on this carnivore diet, even though I've done some significant, uh, you know, I've had ice cream a couple of times, it's, uh, some coconut cake icing a couple of times, during Easter, I have, uh, for the most part, remained ketogenic, never ketogenic in my urine, but always ketogenic in my breath and, uh, and blood. So it makes the point that um, as you get more and more fat adapted, you may not be spilling ketones in your urine. Those of you who are looking to see ketones need to be aware of that. Uh, I would like to wrap up with two things. Jeannie, uh, do you have any comments on what would you do if you do if you try carnivore? What, as far as what, eating? Yeah, what would you eat if you will decide to try carnivore? Eggs and um, probably eggs, cheese, ham, um, chicken, steak. Okay. That's probably it. Some seafood, but uh, yeah. not organ. That yeah, that's I, you will not include organs. I will definitely I'm mean, definitely including organs. I do eat organs. I do, I do have my bacon. I do have my eggs, um, but I do have I do a lot. Uh, do include a lot of chicken. I do a lot of beef, and do, I do a lot of. Uh, we 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 have some special way to cook that, and we can do a video on how to cook meat Mexican style. But there is another uh, part of the seafood, the salmon and mm -hmm. the herrings and the sardines 
those are, are, are important sources, especially because of the omega-3 fatty acids. So I wonder, is Grouper, is Grouper included in that? Which one? Grouper? Grouper? Including I don't know what it is. What? It's, it would clearly be part of a, most people's car, uh, carnivore diet. No, but does it, ha it probably has high omega-3s, right? No. Oh, I don't know. I th I didn't think that it does. Not certainly not like the classics, like you know, salmon and pot, uh, sardine, sardines, Kippers. halibut, kippers, kippers. Yeah. All right. Well, that's of the overall take, Doctor Bird. I'll let you keep the teaser for next week, and uh, then we move on. Well, I appreciate it. You're a good man. So the <laughs> teaser for next week. I'm going to spoil the beans. Um, when Nick Norwitz and Dave Feldman came to talk to us uh, and presented some of their information on uh, low carb and that that upcoming uh, article on lean mass hyper responders, uh, a, a fellow named uh, Adrian Soto, is it Soto Mayor? Soto Mota. Soto Mota joined. And now Adrian and uh, Nick both have doctorates in human metabolism from Cambridge. So these guys know a little bit about what they're talking. I think it's Oxford, but well, oh, I I'm sorry. I'll apologize to, to them next time I see them. Um, but the bottom line is they did a study and they did it with a, with a well-known scientist that we mentioned today. His name is Robert Ludwig, David Ludwig, that guy that's the pediatric endocrinologist that, that wrote the book, Always Hungry. They looked at a well-funded NIH trial, and it was one of these dietary studies. And it was done by an EBM or crowd, energy balance uh, crowd. Uh, and what they said, you know, calories in, calories out. And what they did was they did a head-to-head -head comparison of low carb versus low fat. They originally said, oh, well, this is it. This proves low carb. I mean, low fat. The low carb people got heavier and they added fat. And then you look at the data and it was very interesting what they missed. It's yet another thing. You know, Johnny Anitas at Stanford and the most popular, most downloaded plus article ever titled, Most Publications, Most Published Studies Are Wrong. And sure enough, this was wrong. What they did was they left out something called insulin, even though they collected information on it. So it's a, it can be a confusing study. You know, if it can confuse the academic community, um, even though there were EBM, the EBM crowd, uh, you can see why it can be a little bit confusing. So Jesus and I are going to do our best on trying to translate uh, other translations of this science, it will get a little bit geeky, but it, the, at the end of the day, if you're a, an insulin, uh, model person, carbohydrate insulin model person, you'll love the outcome. Dr. Brewer, I thought you, were, well, I mean, I think that's a really good topic. And the other thing is we, we three of us will be traveling to the Dallas event next week. So yes, we're going to do our best to be on the show and to share that information with you. But I thought you were going to spoil the beans on the article that you shared with me yesterday. Oh, the other one you're talking about. Oh my goodness. So talking about, it's a big fad these days for content creators to have these big admissions like I've changed my mind. I was wrong, et cetera, et cetera. So I've got Jesus and I have one for me and it's there. It does appear to be evidence that there are some stents that can prevent heart attacks. Bum, bum, bum. Drum All roll. Right. Yeah, there you go. There <laughs> are, they have seen some stents prevent heart attacks. Now, every, I don't have to worry about a stampede to the uh, cath lab and getting stents. That stampede has been going on for decades already. Uh, but we're going to cover that. Wh when are we planning on covering that, Jesus? That's what I'm saying. Uh, we have. You thought that was going to be next week or the soda I thought, thing? I, I oh. thought. Oh. Well. We'll decide. It looks you know, like right? it's going to be a surprise, right? Yeah. yeah. Like Let's keep it a surprise for everybody. Uh, e either way. So the point behind that one is it has to do with a thing called 
vulnerable plaque. And uh, Jesus has only been with the show for a couple of years. He keeps getting surprised when I say, yeah, I did a video on that one once too, because he never saw that either. And I did do a video on, quote, vulnerable plaque. And yep, I made the statement that, quote, there's no such thing as a vulnerable plaque. Well, maybe there's a little bit more to the story than that. Yeah. Well, we'll, de we'll decide next week. On, uh, we'll see you here. Thank you so much for, for being here with us today. And share. Remember, subscribe, share. That's This is Life Saving Information. See you next week. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>